I am here with Leo Babauta. Leo, thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's an honor. So I, I think we have some friends in common. I, I believe at least one of them is Tim Ferriss. Is it, you, you know right. Tim, right? Yeah, I would say we're not like we don't hang out every day or anything. But we definitely know each other for sure, and he's a he's a great guy. Well, no one hangs out every day anymore, or any day anymore. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Tim is great, and I've long been a fan. I think I discovered your blog through Tim somehow, either you know his publicly talking about it or emailing sure. about it. But so you run the the Zen Habits blog, which must have an enormous readership at this point. How, how long have you been running the blog? Yeah, I started in the beginning of 2007, so about 13 years or so. And do you have a sense of what your audience is like now? I mean, how many people are on your email list or how many people read the blog? You know what? I had to consciously stop myself from, from following those numbers. So I actually cut them all off so I don't know those numbers. But I know that oh, nice. it's, yeah, it's well over a million uh, readers and when you consider not only the email list, but RSS subscribers and Twitter and things like that. I just decided that that wasn't the best place for my focus. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, you, you found yourself getting caught on the, the hamster wheel of uh, yeah. noticing your numbers go up. Yeah, I, and I'm sure anyone who puts their stuff out in a public way can relate to that where you're just like, okay, how many subscribers do I have? How many you know uh, people are on my list? and uh twitter followers and all of that and it just becomes this way of like you know it, it it motivates you to like try and put stuff out there and do things but i felt like it was motivating me in the wrong way right and so and just like with any numbers we get caught up in them and if that's what we're measuring that's what we're we're trying to focus on and i decided what i really wanted to focus on was not only creating content but helping people and you know it's really harder to measure that and so I, I use like less like metric focused ways of measuring that for myself. But every post that I put out, everything that I've put out, I've always like used that metric as like, how much is my heart into helping people here? Mm. This conversation included. <laughs> yeah. That kind of conscientiousness and top level view of your priorities really comes through in your writing. And it's really what's beautiful about your blog because you I mean, you talk about meditation a lot, obviously, but it's much more of a, an approach to life that comes through in, in what you're putting out there. And it's just a very creative and, and fluid integration of the kinds of lessons people learn in meditation practice That's with right. you know, 21st century living. And it's very unique and, and I've, I've appreciated it for a long time. So it's great to finally get you, if not in the flesh, by voice. Man, I really appreciate that. That's that's really nice to hear. And I think you nailed something that that's really important to me, which is that I draw a lot of wisdom from meditation, from, you know, Zen teachings and try and pull all of that into my life and process it through my own learnings and practices. But then I have to take that and translate it into real-world stuff that applies to like no matter what where you are in life, no matter what you're doing for a living what you're facing in your family situation, what habits you're trying to change. How do we take all of that wisdom and translate it into like actionable, doable stuff? So that's, that's basically what I try and do for a living. And I appreciate that you, you nailed that. Yeah, well, one of the clear signs that you're in the real world is that you have six kids, <laughs> which, which as, a, as a parent of two girls, uh, I really can't imagine how things scale once you go three, four, five, and then six. I didn't think we would talk about this, but do you have a sense of, of how the difficulty scales with the addition of each next kid? I mean, it's, it's three, 50% <laughs> more than two. And I mean, at what point does it? It, it gets easier. It gets think, easier. So, um, yeah, I don't have an exact number uh, for you, but I found that it scales really nicely. Six is definitely harder than two. And, and I'll, I'll have to just be completely honest that my wife actually takes on the majority of that, you know, how much harder that gets. I'm sure, um, but, but that's true of me with sure, two, yeah. so we can discount on both sides of that <laughs> equation. But what, what I found is that one thing that we've learned to do really well, first of all, is train them from the beginning, like early on to become independent and do things for themselves, which is way more work in the beginning, but mm. if that's an investment, you know, like teaching them to tie their shoes is way harder than actually 
tying their shoes real quickly so you can get out the door. But um, if you do the same thing with every single thing, it really helps that to scale easier. So we did a whole bunch of work around getting them to brush their teeth and make their own breakfast and do all the things that we would normally do as soon as they possibly could. And then the other one was helping, uh, having them take responsibility for helping the younger kids. Mm. So we had this whole like system of, of the older kids helping the younger ones, which was great responsibility for them. And they learned a lot through that, but it also takes a lot of load of, off of us. And so I'm not saying that my wife or, or I like, don't have much to do with six kids, but definitely way less than you might expect when you triple two to, to six. Right. Well, yeah. I, I, it seems that if you had a few more kids, you'd have nothing but free time. <laughs> I think that, that might be true. We might, we might try that. No, we're, we're done. We're done. But yeah, you, it sounds like you got started very early because you're, I, I'm sure you're younger than I am and your kids are older. So how old were you when you had your first child? Yeah, embarrassingly young. So I was one of those who basically really early on, I think I was 19 when my soon to be wife got pregnant wow. and um yeah so it was she was my daughter was born when i was still 19 going on 20 and um i actually we have a blended like brady bunch family so i have two from that first wife and two from my current wife and she had two from a previous one so we it's it wasn't that that, that i am responsible for six lives right coming into the world but i'm responsible for them now right right yeah so, yeah, so I did start young for sure. Yeah. So now how did you get into meditation? You know, it, well, there was always an appeal to it for me, um, but it was also this kind of woo woo kind of thing, which I think you can relate to from what I've read of your story. Yeah. And so, yeah, there was a lot of it like, I'm not sure this is really for me, but it was when I started making the changes that led to me creating Zen habits. So I, I went through a whole series of changes in my life that changed my entire life. But the first one was quitting smoking. And I had tried a whole bunch, like seven times before that to quit smoking and didn't, they never stuck. And I had tried a whole bunch of times to do meditation would be another example, exercise, eating healthy, a bunch of different things. And I was failing at all of them and just feeling like a failure. But with, I decided to pour everything into just one change, which was quitting smoking. And I was doing it not only for myself, but to save the lives of my kids and my wife who was going to start smoking again after her pregnancy. So I was really motivated. And so I reached for every single tool that I could possibly find, every research paper, every group online. And uh, so I reached for a bunch of them, habit change ideas. And meditation was one, one of them. And what I really learned was that I had a bunch of triggers around smoking that made me reach for a cigarette. And one of them was stress. And so I said, okay, I need to find something else to do whenever I feel stressed. Notice the trigger and then do the new habit instead of the old one. And I said, oh, what can I do? So I started running. I started like massaging myself uh, just to try and ease the stress. And then the other thing I tried was meditation. And it turned out to be like one of the best things that I could have done, but it was a total just shot in the dark. And one of the things I learned with quitting smoking that was so valuable was to meditate on the urge to smoke. So every time I would get the urge, before I wouldn't even notice the urge, I would just act on it. But this time I actually stopped and just watched the urge arise in my body and it just kind of rose like a wave and then crested and then kind of faded away. And then it would come back, but maybe less this time. And each time it would be like a wave, but I learned that I could just stay with that urge and it would, I didn't need to act on it. And that was like a mind blowing, like life transforming, like realization yeah. that I was, I was able to apply to all the other habits, whether it was running or waking up early or procrastination. And in fact, that one thing, along with a number of other tools that I, I figured out for habits, but that one kind of meditation changed my whole life. So that's when I said, oh, maybe this is not just all, you know, like woo woo, like Eastern spirituality, but actually it's practical. And um, yeah, like I said, that changed my life. Mm. And so what was the source of instruction you first encountered? I hit on Zen mind, beginner's mind, mm. uh, which was a nice, nice accident for me. And I've been on the Zen path ever since then. But um, yeah, Zen mind, beginner's mind, I'm sure, have you, I'm sure yeah. you've run across it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's one so, of the classics. Yeah. So I read it and I like, I don't know what the hell this guy's talking about. 
uh like it it was all like these really like vague kind of concepts but there was something in it to the simplicity of it and i i can't remember the phrase but there was a phrase in there that stuck with me and basically it was all encouragement to sit and meditate and so i'm like okay let me just try it and i didn't really get the point of it but that book was definitely a big encouragement for me and when i when i did get the point of meditation or at least the point of it for me when I was when I was quitting smoking, and then I started sitting more uh, regularly. I went back to the book and started trying like understand what he was talking about, and eventually it led me to uh, when we moved to San Francisco. It led me to go to San Francisco Zen Center, and I connected with the teacher there, and and that was my path. But but that book somehow like there was something in it, the simplicity of it, or something. I I really also love the idea of simplicity. So Zen really spoke to me in that way yeah yeah well that, yeah. that also comes through in your blog your blog is very zen in its layout oh thank you and so did you go on to sit any zen retreats i have a lot of resistance to sitting in retreats mm. so i i mostly sit on my own um or with people now that i'm, I'm offering meditations online but i have sat in uh, zen retreats i've also led retreats and um i've done like zen workshops at Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, right. where I've also sat there. So yeah, more kind of like I've done it in, in different spurts, but nothing too dedicated. But right now, actually, I'm on the uh, path with the teacher, my Zen teacher. So I'm kind of like working with the Zen precepts and working to lay ordination right now. Mm, nice. Yeah. Were psychedelics ever part of your path? You know, um, no, no. No, they haven't been yet. Mm. But uh, I have friends who are incredibly into it, and um, so I'm I'm totally open to the idea. And I have seen their benefits, and so I think they are an amazing tool. And one of the things that I've I've gotten from a friend who's really into it is that it can take you to certain not only realizations but meditative states that would take you know someone like a Zen master years to get to, which is yeah, I think quite an amazing thing. But so far, no, I haven't, I haven't dabbled. So what is it that you principally teach? One thing mm. that is interesting about at least what I've read of yours on Zen Habits is the integration of wisdom always sounds a mm. little pretentious in <laughs> English, but I mean, really, yeah. really what we're talking about is wisdom in the end. And, sure. you know, the, 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 you know, wisdom for me is really noticing the causes of psychological suffering and noticing where they're unnecessary and then then you stop doing those things at the level of your attention or behavior that are producing needless suffering for yourself and others and so you do a you do a lot of work around integrating meditation born wisdom with everything else people want to get out of life so a lot of yeah. you know habit formation reflection and mm -hmm. it's really just kind of recipes for living sanely and catching yourself in the moment where you have decided to make a change in your life you've decided that at least the self who's online now is sure that he or she wants to quit smoking or wants to lose weight or wants to right. start a regular meditation practice or wants to change some dynamic in his or her marriage or some pitfall of parenting or whatever it is mm -hmm. and ways to actually not lose the vividness and practical implications of that epiphany and actually make it actionable and, and make the change. So what is it that you think you've learned on that front? We could talk about specific cases like the struggle people have in even forming a regular meditation practice. You know, that might be yeah. one case. Just kind of walk us through the kinds of things you've learned through self-experiment and, and the kinds of things you recommend at this point. Yeah, so I st the way I started was with habit change and changing your life. And I've I s I did that for a long time and and I'd love to dive into that if you're if you're interested in that part of it. But the latest piece of it that I've been in the last few years has been around fear and fearlessness. Mm. So all the things that hold us back that keep us trapped in our old patterns. I've been diving into that and helping people do their meaningful work in life and face and be with and change their relationship with fear. So that's been my work lately. But definitely I started out with, 
you know, changing habits and using mindfulness practices to be able to deal with all of the habit change obstacles that were facing us. One example is just, okay, I'm in the moment of like, I should go and exercise or I should sit down and meditate. And like, I in instantly want to turn away from it to, to my email or messages or, you know, online, you know, all of the usual things that we turn toward all of the comforts. And so what I've learned to help people with is to pause in that moment of like, hey, it's time to meditate or it's time to exercise and I want to turn away from it. And so usually that's just automatic, but if you can bring like some kind of mindfulness to that moment and just pause and just notice like, oh, I'm feeling resistance here. Oh, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> and just staying with that resistance and just being with it and then bringing some breath to it and some kindness to it, some compassion, and then giving yourself that moment of choice and reminding yourself of why this is important to you and what's your intention here. Just coming back to that is such a powerful thing and it only has to take you know a handful of seconds and then you have choice. So that's, that was one of my earliest discoveries that I help people with. So yeah, that can change all kinds of habits. But the other one, so another, there's a number of steps along the way in terms of habit change. Another one is what happens after you didn't do it. So a lot of us will say we're going to do something and be really great at it for a little while. And then after a week or two, we fall off. And then what happens is this is the, one of the most destructive patterns is beating ourselves up, feeling bad about it, feeling guilt, shame, all of those usual patterns. And so we have these negative voices, maybe a voice we developed in childhood as a defense mechanism, but that, that just starts kicking in. And I know people who like will drink alcohol, even though they told themselves they're not going to. And in the morning, they're, they wake up hungover and then just start two hours of beating themselves up in anger and shame. And that is, to say the least, not helpful in habit change hmm. or in life in general. <laughs> And so cha changing how you talk to yourself, you need to bring mindfulness to that first, and then you bring some compassion practice to that as well. So those are two, two big areas. Let's linger on that sure. moment because it's interesting to consider whether shame and regret and those classically negative states of mind mm -hmm. have a, any utility. Because one of the things I've been, been impressed by when, you're, when you look at the behavior of psychopaths or people who are, you know, functionally psychopaths is that the thing that they're lacking, like the brakes that have been removed mm -hmm. from the car, I think can be described as shame uh, rather often, right. you know, and there's, there's a kind of shamelessness that really seems dysfunctional and lets the maniac out for all time. So I'm, I'm tempted to think that there's, it is a necessary part of our, of a healthy, well-integrated mind, because I mean, just take, let's take the a specific case, like, you, you know, you've decided that alcohol is a problem for you. And, mm -hmm. you know, let's say by any third party view of the situation, it really is a problem for you. It's not, mm -hmm. this is not just a, a vanity project. You're someone who's, who shouldn't be drinking right. and yet you've lapsed again. And now you feel shame over this. And it, perhaps you even feel shame and regret for something you said or did while drunk last mm -hmm. night. And I guess I'm tempted to say that punctate experience of, of shame and regret mm -hmm. can be a very useful and even necessary signal. I mean, it, it is information. I mean, this is telling you there's a change in your life that you really want to make, and here's why, right? Like, you, right. you don't want to feel this way again. And so I feel like there's some, there must be some way to extract that lesson and then simply wisely let go of the, the psychological suffering and move on with the behavior change, you know, further locked in and further motivated. So but yeah. I don't know how you, how you view that moment psychologically. Yeah. I, so I agree that shame has valuable function in our society. I mean, it's what keeps us, I think, a functioning society. And I think as just as humans, we have developed shame as a social, social tool. It's, I mean, it's how we keep children in line. It's how we keep people from, you know, crapping on each other, really. <laughs> So there's, there's value in it, but what happens, what I found what happens is that we internalize that shame that has been handed down to us from our parents and teachers and society. 
and we internalize it into this voice that just shames us over and over for all of the things that we think we've done wrong. And that is actually very destructive. It can be in the way that you're describing it, in this idealized version of it, like, yes, okay, there's information here. I did something that, that's not helpful to me. And so I can feel that shame, use that as information, then let it go to the point where it's not, dis not destructive anymore. But what I found is that's never, that's never the case for people who are struggling with this stuff. I think that it can be the case, maybe if you're like this high-functioning individual who doesn't that doesn't beat themselves up to a destructive tendency and you don't you're not at that point you're probably not dealing with alcoholism you're an alcoholic because of the shame and so what happens is you feel shame about yourself and you find you need to cope with it in some way and so you you've reached for alcohol alcohol or drugs or a number of other destructive things you know cigarettes are another example you've reached for it as a coping mechanism because you basically don't know how to deal with shame that's never been a thing that was taught to you as a kid, which if we could teach people how to deal with shame in a healthy way and then use that as a tool, as kids, I think that would be great, but that's not what our society does. And so people then reach for alcohol and then they learn, oh, that gave me a little bit of relief. It also made me feel bad the next morning. Well, then I feel shame about that. Then you reach for alcohol again. And so there's this feedback loop that keeps you doing it to the point where now you don't even need the shame, you know, any stress at all. Uh, makes you want to go for alcohol or even just habit. And so that's what I found is that that actually keeps us locked in our old destructive patterns. And to liberate us from that, we need to bring in compassion and break the cycle of shame and beating ourselves up. And I've, found, I've seen it over and over, people who overeat, we blame them so much. All the people who are obese in our country or in the world, we blame them for making themselves fat. And yet the, the truth is, we shame them over and over and taught them to make themselves feel terrible and they then reach for food because we also teach them as kids to reach for food for comfort. And so we've created the perfect system for them to become obese. And so we have to break the cycle of shame. So I, I think compassion is really the only, the only thing that I've found to work. And I've worked with people one-on-one -on -one who've dealt with alcohol and, and food addictions. And that's to me, you have to, you have to start there. And if you want to then get to a place where you're completely compassionate with yourself to a fault where like mm. now you're like letting yourself off the hook all the time, there's a, there's another um, way that we can use that information that you talked about. That's really useful. So the, people will often not want to be compassionate with themselves because they're like, well, then I'm letting myself off the hook and I'm never going to actually make a change. Well, what I found is that's not true. First of all, that's something that we've told ourselves. So the first thing that we have to do is let go of that story and say, well, there are other motivations for change. And one is I care about myself. So if you can start caring about yourself, loving yourself, you know, not smoking, not drinking too much is a loving act for yourself. So motivate from that place. And it's like if you're familiar with training a dog, we have trained dogs for so long by smacking them over the nose with a newspaper. And dog trainers now know that that's the worst way to train a dog. Mm. Um, the best way is, is by rewards and getting them to approximate closer and closer the, the behavior that we want. Well, we've trained our own minds in so many, for so many years by smacking it over the head, not with a newspaper actually, but with a really hard stick with spikes on it. And so the way that we need to do to rethink that is to train our minds using rewards, using positive feedback until it approximates the thing that we want closer and then give it feedback for going closer. And then just not, not putting energy into all of the uh, negative stuff that we do, hmm. which is what, yeah, we, when, you, when you give attention to a dog for doing the bad behavior, hey, at least it got attention, right? So then it starts, it, it gets confused about whether it should do that or not. So we do, we do the same thing with our minds. We give it so much attention for doing the wrong things rather than giving it attention for doing the right things, which it does do, but we barely ever give that any attention. So, yeah, so how do you implement that advice, but withdrawing attention from negative things and shining it on positive? Yeah. So first of all, we almost never give ourselves any praise for anything really, but any praise for the positive things that we do that, that go. So let's say you, let's say you wanted to meditate and you sit down and you meditate and you got up and you're like, oh, I sucked at that meditation, right? 
So what about the fact that you sat down and meditated? Praise that and stop beating yourself up for not doing it. So whenever you no notice yourself beating yourself up, switch it to praise. What did you do right? And give yourself some compassion when you're feeling pain. Okay, so then I sat and meditated, and this time I meditated, and I was able to stick with the breath for like three counts. Great. That's like amazing. Like you're actually doing it. So praise the, the thing that you want to keep doing. And just forget about the other stuff for now. And you can use it as feedback, but definitely don't give that too much attention. And then just keep praising and moving closer to the thing that you want. So give yourself attention, give yourself praise, give yourself positive feedback, compassion would be one, love and all of that stuff. And so as you move closer, you know, maybe you meditated five days out of seven this week. That's better than the zero you were doing the week before, right? So we, we look at the two that we missed and we're like, oh, I, I failed. I didn't do seven like I wanted to. Well, what about the five that you did? And so praise those with the ones that you didn't completely remove all emotion, all the negative feedback that we normally do. And just notice, what, where did I go wrong? And then praise yourself for noticing that. So we usually put way too much emotion into the parts where we went wrong. So start praising the parts where we did mm -hmm. right, put more emotion into that, more attention to that. And the ones where we went wrong, just say, oh, that's interesting. This actually makes me worry about one of the features in the Waking Up app. Hmm. We have given people some personal stats that they can track, you know, like the number of, sure. of days and the number of you know, mindful minutes. And, and, and one feature is that, is that they can see their current streak. And people clearly care about their streaks. Yep. If there's a glitch with the app and, and their streak got broken because of you know, some software update they didn't get or whatever, then you know, we, we hear from these people by the, yeah. by the, by the hundreds yeah. in customer service. So people care. And it occurs to me that you know, if you're maintaining a 100-day you know, meditation streak and there's some yeah. glitch in your life and you lose it, right? Or you, you, know, yeah. you, just, you fail to meditate on, a, on any given Thursday, and you go back to zero, and, and, and honestly, I really have not thought much about the implications here. I've sort of just adopted what so many other app designers have done with this, you know, yeah. with this personal data. But it strikes me as potentially either unhelpful or right. kind, of, kind of prioritizing the wrong signal. Yeah. Like now it occurs to me it would be better to have a percentage measure of like a, the rolling average of the last 30 days mm -hmm. and you, you've kept your percentage above 90% or something, that right. seems, seems much less punitive than just losing your streak. But uh, do you have any thoughts about yeah. what would be actually helpful for people and not yeah. helpful? I love that. That's very perceptive. And, I, and I'm, I'm really happy that you saw that because a lot of apps, not just meditation apps, but habit apps in general, will encourage streaks. And streaks are useful to encourage you to keep going until they stop. And then they're incredibly destructive. And all of us who've done you know, these, these meditation apps where the streak stops, we missed a day for whatever reason. Maybe we were traveling. Maybe you know, just something came up. All of a sudden, like, it's down to zero from, yeah, like you said, 100. Sometimes it's you know, 18 days, and then it's zero again. And that's so discouraging. And that's exactly the opposite of what an app wants to do when someone has hit that point. When they've stopped, skipped a day, it's an incredibly powerful opportunity to encourage them because skipping a day is not even a big deal in the grand scheme of things, as we all know, right? But it becomes a big deal when that's the only measurement. So the best thing you can do is say, oh, you've skipped a day. We found that you know, people who skip you know, one day, no big deal. Like That's not a big deal. But if you skip two days in a row, that's way harder. So try not to do that. So one day, no, de no big deal, but don't let yourself skip two days or something like that. Mm. Yeah, so find some way to encourage them at that moment to, keep, to start back up. Because as you know, starting back up is way more important than the, the skipping the day. Yeah. Yeah. The truth is, obviously, on some level, the more meditation, the better, or the more consistency, right. the better, except ultimately, the practice isn't even about becoming a meditator, much less a regular meditator. I mean, the mm. thing that I'm trying to precipitate in people is a new way of viewing their experience moment to moment such yeah. that they relinquish certain kinds of fairly predictable ways of being unhappy. And 
Right. It's just a fact that for most of us, this tends to require regular practice, especially right. in the beginning. But the message to impart in the end is that the goal is not to be a merely consistent meditator in mm. that you have an unbroken string of formal meditations. It's to be That's true. consistent in the frequency with which you punctuate your day-to-day -day living with clear seeing of the nature of experience. Right. And yeah. meditating once a week is so much more than never meditating that yeah. it's nice for that message to get through as well. That's great. It's a little bit like working out. I don't know if you do any weight training, but yeah, I do. The jump from zero to one is so important. I mean, it's just enormous. Yeah. Like if you were just, if you did one good workout in the gym a week, yeah. I don't know if that's 80% of the gains, but it's certainly close. And yeah. then you're refining from good to perfect, you know, thereafter. But right. But still encouraging to go from, you know, one a week to two. Yeah. Um, it's still, still a good thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, for sure. Like the messaging of the app, you know, the, the stats you're giving them and the reminders is just maybe encouraged to keep doing it, right? Encourage them to sit down um, and each act is, is a good thing for them. It doesn't have, but it doesn't have to be like every single day or, or so many days in a row. Yeah, I, I love that. What would you say to a skeptic with respect to this whole project? I don't know if this is something you encounter much in uh, your line of work anymore, but I mean, certainly in my day job on the podcast or you know, as a writer, as a public speaker, when there used to be a world you could go out and speak in public to, I encounter a fair amount of skepticism along the lines that you you said you felt at one point where you just think you associate yeah, meditation right. with woo or you know pseudoscientific you know quackery right wearing crystals and you know <laughs> consulting alternative medicine as opposed to real medicine when you're sick we all know that there's all kinds of ways in which people mislead themselves or get misled in sure traditional religious contexts or in you know new age cultic ones so there's, there's a lot to be embarrassed by in the, mm -hmm. in the self-help spiritual side of a bookstore. But, you know, it's also pretty clear there's a baby in the bathwater there that we don't want to yeah. throw out. So how do you talk to someone who's just fundamentally skeptical that there's really anything to realize by taking 10 minutes out of one's day to pay attention? Yeah, I love that, that question. And I think you and I are both similar in that, that we're we were both skeptics and uh, and we still r maintain our skeptical mind when it comes to this stuff but we've been won over <laughs> because it works you know so for me the the thing that's worked is really point to the problem that they want to change because if you just talk about wisdom um, and you talk about all of those things which are absolutely translatable if you start talking about that stuff they don't quite get it because they're not looking for that but if you tell them like oh this you know you want to work on procrastination, you want to work with feeling overwhelmed or too busy, all of these things that you want to like try and shift, these are things that they're butting their heads against the wall trying to shift. They're, and they're reaching for their usual things, another tool, another book, another system, you know, all of these like tips and tricks that don't work because they're not addressing the fundamental problems. So if you can point to the thing that they really want help with, which is why I'll often talk about habits and things like that productivity on my blog, because that's what people, that's the pain point that people are feeling. If you can get to one of their pain points. And right now the pain point that I'm pointing to is, you know, do you want to do your meaningful work or not? Like what's the thing that's getting in the way of that? So if you can point to that and talk to speak to them at that level, they're like, yes, this is what I want. <laughs> okay. What can I do? And then, and then you show them where their automatic habits, their automatic patterns are, are the thing that's causing them to stick to, you know, like why they can't change it, and that they need to then change it from automatic to conscious. That's where, the, for me, the magic has happened. It's like, oh, I can bring attention to this and really like dive into the mental processes that are happening right now and be able to like change things which where right now I'm trapped because why do I keep reaching for the cigarettes or the alcohol when I don't want to? I tell myself I don't want to and then I just keep doing it, right? And if you can give them choice at that moment to change their own lives, that's to me a really powerful thing. And then you say, well, if you could stop and do this, wouldn't that be, 
wouldn't that shift that? And they're like, yes. And then, okay, here's what I want you to do. You need to do some training. And so I frame it in ways that us in the Western world have been basically brought up to really care about is like training really works. Meditation, maybe not, but training does. I'll do exercises. I'll do challenges. Like those kinds of terms really work for me. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's an interesting tension here between trying to improve one's life, you know, trying to mm -hmm. become someone on some level. I mean, we, we have ideas about who right. we want to be or wish we were, the kinds of lives we want to have, and the distance between those concepts and our present moment-to-moment -moment reality, that, that is right. either motivating to a degree or it's, you know, it's depressing. Or, but in any case, the distance there is something that becomes salient for people and they, and they wish right. they could live differently and get different results in their life. And yet the wisdom born of meditation is often described as the recognition that the present moment is already perfect, you know, or that consciousness right. is already free, you know, or the self right. is already an illusion. And the recommendation is to find a, a mode of being in the present moment that really is completely at rest and at peace with and accepting of whatever's happening all on its own right now. Right. And, you know, I, you know, I'm convinced there's no conflict between that mode of being and getting lots of things done in the world sure. and going on to do good things and to improve. I mean, if you want to learn to play the guitar, you can learn to play the guitar even while being mindful and equanimous and at rest. So there, there is no real contradiction. But when people first encounter this messaging, it can seem like it's at best a paradox. What do you say to this tension between real acceptance in the present of the present and trying to put one's life in order because one has a has a some kind of landmark or or set of landmarks you know out there in the future that one wants to reach right well and i and i think it's a completely valid objection to like self improvement type <laughs> modalities right but if you notice that i never talked about you asked me about the messaging to the skeptics i never talked about self improvement never talked about bettering yourself or even becoming productive, it was more around the pain that they're feeling. So I, I went to suffering just like Buddha did, right? So looking at the pain points, where are they struggling, and then helping them to bring mindfulness to that point, but with the right messaging. So I, when people come to me and say, oh, I want to improve myself, I want to become a better person, I never acknowledge that. I'm like, that you're already a better person, but I, you know, they don't want to necessarily hear that. Um, I have said that to people, and they almost never hear it. So the thing is, talking about acceptance of the present moment and and that you're already you already have Buddha nature, you know, no one gets that, and no, so you can't use that with the skeptics. You can only speak to the people who've already had some experience with this and talk about self acceptance and just like. You know, things are already amazing. We don't need to change them. Well, it doesn't feel that way to them. So, they, so to speak to the skeptics, you have to talk about pain, some pain point that they're trying to struggle with. That's my answer to that question. But absolutely, the real secret medicine is it's already amazing. You already, you already have basic goodness in you, and you just need to learn to see that. But you can't use that messaging because most people will never get that. They're like, what? Basic goodness? I don't believe in that at all. And it, that's not the fundamental message of our society is that things are basically good. That's the exact opposite. Our society says things are fundamentally broken. We have original sin and we are all messed up and there's, uh, we need to fix it, but we need to you know, buy things to fix it. So <laughs> that's our messaging. And we have to, and so to speak a completely different language to people who that's how they've been raised and that's the, the, the water that they're swimming in, they won't hear it and they'll just call it woo-woo, right? So that's where I've, I've had to shift myself. I can't talk about wisdom or basic goodness or Buddha nature or any of that stuff because, or even, accept, even the word acceptance. Acceptance is a negative thing in our society, especially to skeptics. Acceptance mm. means you're accepting that everything is okay and like you're not broken. Well, then you've given up on life. 
And so you can't talk about that. I completely agree. Acceptance is where it's at, but uh, you have to kind of get them in the door first. And people who go into Zen monasteries, for example, when they first go in, it's because they just got through a divorce, because they're reaching for a lifeline and they're in pain. And so the pain gets them in the door, but once they've sat down and meditated for a while and listened to some Dharma talks, then they start understanding, oh, maybe there's something to this, but that's never the thing that gets them in the door. So what has your focus on fear been like? How did fear become especially salient to you and what have you learned about it? Yeah, so this was through both uh, my Zen meditation training, but also through um, learning the wisdom of the Tibetan Buddhists like Chogyam Trungpa and, and Pema Chodron. Mm. Amazing wisdom and the way that they phrase things is, is so, so beautiful that it really draws people to it. And so it's around, so impermanence, but also uncertainty is another way to phrase it, or just like groundlessness. So I started diving into that myself and just seeing like the rich training that, that's available there and how much people needed that medicine. So fear turns out to be not something that people want to admit that they have very often. Mm -hmm. It's like something they, they spend a lot of energy and time ignoring um, and pretending that they're not afraid. But we all feel fear. I mean, this current world situation is, is one example, but just every day we're feeling shakiness about ourselves in the world about you know social situations about the work that we need to do about how much we're failing at everything and so we all, we're all feeling some kind of fear or anxiety or uncertainty and so i usually speak to uncert uncertainty because everyone feels that even if they also don't want to admit that uh, we all feel some kind of shakiness or uncertainty about ourselves or about the situation that we're in and so i i i, I focus on that but what I found is that our, every single day, every single moment, we're facing this uncertainty about ourselves and life. And so we have developed so many ways of dealing with that because we do not like the shakiness of that uncertainty. You know, just the, the shakiness of talking to someone like you, <laughs> who is like this amazing person. Am I going to be good enough to talk with him, right? So that kind of shakiness. We face that all the time. What should I do right now? Am I behind on everything? And so what we've, we, since we don't like that feeling of uncertainty, we instantly reach for ways to control, ways to get certain. And one control is I'm going to procrastinate. Another one is I'm, not just, I'm just not going to do this because I might fail. Another one is I need to get everything in order or get all the right books or read all mm. the things. So we try and control things. I need to get the right system, the right tools, the right software. And if I can get all of these things, then I won't have uncertainty. And we have many of these. I can go on for, for hours about all of our patterns. But we have many ways to try and get rid of the uncertainty. And what I've learned, the real secret sauce is that actually uncertainty is not a problem. And we can just learn to train ourselves to stay in uncertainty, open up to it, accept it, as you said and just be in it, you know, get comfortable with it. And one, one quote that illustrates that really well by uh, Chogam Trimpa is something around the bad news is that we're falling through air without, a, uh, we're falling through the air without a parachute, right? That's the bad news. Mm. The good news is there's no ground below us. And right. so if you can just relax, like, oh, there's, you're not going to hit anything. It just feels like groundless. There's no control here. And if you can just relax into that, you don't need to do all of the other things that we normally do that get in the way of us doing our meaningful work, of enjoying life, finding joy and gratitude in each moment. So there's so much rich things that can come out of just being comfortable with uncertainty. And you can train yourself to do that and actually be fully open and appreciative of this uncertain, shaky, groundless moment. So that's the training I've been doing and training people in. So what are the signs that someone is not sufficiently comfortable with uncertainty that wouldn't necessarily present as a conscious awareness of fear or anxiety? Yeah. Well, I would say you're human, first of all. That's probably a good sign. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, 
But so I would say most of us have a discomfort with uncertainty. Pretty much everybody, unless you've been training for a long time with this specifically. And that would be like Zen masters and, you know, people like that, like, or like yourself maybe. But I would say uh, to, to really answer your question in a more satisfactory way, pretty much all the things that we do that are not like what we, to our liking, usually are some versions of what we do when we're feeling uncertainty. So let's, let's just say, for example, you're constantly annoyed with people or frustrated with your family members or coworkers. That's a good sign that there is some kind of uncertainty around that relationship that is causing you to be frustrated. You know, you're looking out at what people are doing out in the world and like, oh, that's so frustrating. So that's a good one is, are you constantly frustrated with people? Another one is, are you constantly distracted? Distraction is one of our favorite ways to go to run from uncertainty. Another one is, are you procrastinating? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Are you, are you way too busy in your life? Are you overworked? All of those are signs that you're doing something to avoid uncertainty. Are you avoiding difficult conversations? So a number of these things. But what I usually like to do, because actually it, it shows up in every area of our lives, I usually like to have people pick one thing to do. So if it's, let's say it's meditation, but it could also be like, I want to write something. I want to write a book, right? So pick something that you want to do that feels meaningful, that you care about, but you haven't done it yet. So I want to write a book. So choose a time every day, 8 a.m for example, and let's say 30 minutes a day, you're going to write. And so you block that off in your calendar, you set a reminder, and you tell yourself, that's what I'm going to do. And it should be for a meaningful reason that, that really helps this training. So I want to write so that it can help people with something, right? Or to bring a smile to people's face. So you have a meaningful reason, and then watch what happens. So at 8 a.m., see what happens. Now, maybe you wrote for half an hour, and you did that the next day, at some point you're going to hit your edge of uncertainty and you will run from it or do what your usual thing is. So notice what you do. And then what I like to do is have a regular review process with someone else, ideally. So maybe you have a partner or a group and every week on Monday you review how you did the previous week. So you can review, how did I do with my 30 minutes of writing every day? Well, I didn't do it at all. Okay, why not? And so what happened at 8 a.m.? Oh, I don't know. I checked my email. I checked my, my messages. Okay. So what I want you to do is at 8 a.m. when you're about to check your messages, stop for a moment and meditate. Or, you know, we don't have to call it meditation, but, but, do, but pause and just notice how you're feeling. Oh, I'm feeling like I really don't want to write. I'm feeling resistance. And I feel like, you know, so then through this process, they start to bring awareness to it because usually we will have almost zero awareness of the fear and uncertainty. So that's basically what I do is I get, I create a container for practicing this. Just like meditation is a set container. I'm going to sit for a certain number of minutes and watch. So meditation is actually the same kind of thing, but I'm going to sit and watch what happens, what arises. People might not want to meditate though. So I give them a different kind of practice container where they're going to write a book for a certain number of minutes and then watch what happens within that container. So it brings awareness to that, that piece of what they're trying to do in life. Now, obviously, if they could bring this kind of awareness to every area of their lives, conversations, you know, distractions, all of those things, that would be amazing. But usually it helps to just start with one thing, have one thing that you're focusing on and really watch what happens. And some good questions in the review for bringing up that, bringing attention to that. Mm. Yeah. Where does perfectionism fit in here? Perfectionism is a great example of control. Actually, all of them are, are basically we're trying to grasp for some kind of solid certainty, some solid ground under our feet. When we're, we're basically whenever the rug gets pulled out from under our feet, which is moment to moment, we're constantly trying to grasp for something. So if you imagine yourself, the rug gets pulled out and you like uh, instantly try and grasp for the walls around you, right? Or something to hold on to. That's what we're doing whenever we grasp for control or any, any of our usual patterns. So perfectionism is exactly that. It's like, okay, if I can get control over this and get everything perfect, then people won't judge me. You know what I mean? Like that's judging, being judged is one of those uncertainties that will make people want to do perfectionism. So I've, 
I've, I've coached writers who, who put their work online as a blogger. And so usually what they'll want to do is get their blog posts perfect or get all of the, you know, the design perfect and everything perfect about the blog before they put it out so that they won't get judged. Well, it's an impossible thing. You can't control what people are going to think of you. Of course, when you think about it logically, but our minds want to control it. So we try and get every detail perfect or we just don't do it at all. So perfectionism is a great example of that. Yeah, there, there are a few heuristics here, I mean, some of which are from uh, the self-help world, which do have a lot of wisdom packed into them. I mean, one question, I don't know who it originates with, it could be Tony Robbins for all I know, but mm -hmm. asking yourself, you know, what would you attempt to do if you knew you couldn't fail? Yeah. Assume that whatever you're going to do is going to succeed. Well, then what would you do? And for most people, that unlocks a, a door into a range of possibilities. That That's right. They're not necessarily aware of discounting. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, okay, then I probably would try to play the guitar. If I knew I w could play the guitar, if I only tried, well, then, yeah, then I would take guitar lessons and I would do that. So I, but I'm not aware in my day-to-day -day life of assuming I have no musical talent or it's just going to be too hard or I'm just not going right. to get there. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe I just convinced myself to take up guitar. We'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, love, I love that approach because it basically just removes all of our usual, our usual blockages. And I, that's the same, actually, same kind of thing that I'm trying to do here, which is if you knew you didn't have to run from uncertainty, what would that open up for you? Right. And the thing is, most people don't even know they're running from uncertainty. So that's hard. It's a hard question. Your question's a lot better for that. And I do use that question for things. If you didn't have any, if you had zero fears here, if you knew you couldn't fail, those kinds of things. But if you use that same kind of idea, if you no longer had to fear uncertainty and you could just relax and be in it, what would that change for you? And honestly, it would change so much for all of us. We would do our meaningful work. We wouldn't go to our old comforts, all the things that we don't want to do anymore. We could be more relaxed. All of these amazing things that we want for ourselves would be possible if we didn't have to fear uncertainty. So what more is needed to live a truly examined life beyond meditation? Mm. What else do you teach or recommend or, or have in your toolkit? That's a tough question to answer, but mm -hmm. One of the ones that comes to mind when you ask that question. So I talked about fear. So the next step beyond this is what, what I've just been talking about of, of getting comfortable with uncertainty is using all of our most negative emotions. I, I found this, so this is still meditation, but it's just not our usual version of meditation. So you can use anger, you can use intense fear. So go and do this, like the scariest thing you can imagine. Imagine yourself putting yourself at the edge of that and just staying there and then using the fear as a pathway, basically, to wisdom as, as a meditation. Or mm -hmm. let's say you're like incredibly angry and just like let that fl flame up. You can use that as, as well and just like let yourself be in the anger and explore it. Mm. which is exactly the opposite of what most people want to do. They want to get out of the anger. They see it as not useful. And it's like this poison that you don't want. And that's true to some extent, but it actually is useful if we can use it as a path for transformation. Like imagining us learning like an incredible thing so that we no longer have to run from, you know, when anger first flares up, you can stay in the middle of it. Mm. And and there's a lot of there's a lot of rich ground training ground there as well. So all of the things that we normally think of as the most ignorant things or the things that we don't want, all the negative things, using that as a path for transformation. Yeah, well, that's, so that's one. That's essentially yeah. tantra. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So I, I, to give a little color to that, so yeah, you know, it's, it's often I mean to take I mean tantra is actually beyond Buddhism per se, but it, it exists mm -hmm. within. Vajrayana Buddhism, let's take the, the Buddhist framing here. The oldest presentation of you know, what's called Buddhism and the, the Eightfold Path and the way in which meditation and ethics and you know, right conduct are all put together as a path of practice, the explicit message there is what we want to do is we want to 
decondition ourselves of negative emotions. So an emotion like anger mm -hmm. is something we want to have less of, and there's there are ways to have less of it. There are certain kinds mm -hmm. of reflections, and then there's mindfulness itself as a way of diminishing this negative emotion. You know, you, you mm -hmm. notice the thoughts that are kindling the anger and seeming to justify it, and you let those go, and then you become interested in the the mere energy of the emotion, and then you notice it has a very short half life, and you do more and more of that, and you use your attention in, in more and more wholesome ways, and you consciously see the good in people as opposed to the bad, and you meditate on compassion and all the rest. And the explicit goal is really to have less and less anger. And whenever anger does arise, it's the sign that at minimum, you know, moments ago, you were lost in some unwholesome pattern of thought and, you know, you got angry again. And so the path is to do less of that. Whereas in Tantra, you know, it, Tantra doesn't deny the the wisdom or utility or psychological reality of that first path, but it includes this recognition that when you're able to recognize the nature of consciousness, you know, in particular, when you're able to recognize it without the feeling of self, you know, mm -hmm. without the feeling that there's a, a center there, then in that moment, really any object of meditation is as good as any other. I mean, there really isn't. There are no objects of meditation in that moment. There's just mm -hmm. consciousness and its contents. And what's more, any intense experience can kind of heighten the vividness of that recognition so that you can consciously work with classically negative states of mind like anger or lust or fear and mm -hmm you know, kind of break the spell of, you know, subject-object perception in the midst of those emotions and recognize that your freedom from self is not at all predicated on anything changing. I mean, the anger does not even have to dissipate and consciousness is already free. And in that moment, anger isn't even anger. It's just the pure energy of being on some mm -hmm. level. The idea is you, you, you wind up transmuting negative emotions in their very moment of arising as wisdom. Mm -hmm. These negative emotions in the, the Dzogchen framing, they dawn as wisdom. Now, the one caveat to all of that that I, you know, I think we can't ignore as we see you know, one esteemed guru after another <laughs> flame out and destroy their reputation and the spiritual legacy they've built because they've been so misbehaved among their students, is that there's a kind of safety net with the first framing that you clearly lose with the second. I mean, in the first mm. framing, it's about becoming, by definition, more ethical, more scrupulous, less of a rapacious rock star who's presenting as a, an egomaniac. And yet in the tantric framing, it does leave open the door to playing with all of the energy of life and transcending desire even while one is gratifying it and transcending right. egocentricity, even while one can seem to be animated by it. And unless you're pretty close to perfect in your recognition of things, you know, th this really does seem a path by which many accomplished meditators, I mean, there's no question that a lot of these teachers who have self destructed had genuine experience and knew how to have mm -hmm. that experience again on demand. But because they took the training wheels off, they did flame out because they just created so much chaos around them. Mm. And that's a bit of a conundrum, but that's something that many of us have seen for as long as we've been paying attention to this, sure. this space. Yeah. And I love, first of all, I love how clearly you lay that out for everybody. So thank you for that very clear-eyed uh, explanation of, of Tantra and the whole Buddhist path. So first of all, absolutely. I think that it, it can be a dangerous edge to walk. So I'm, I'm, I'm not walking quite on that edge yet. I'm using kind of like beginner stages of that, you know, anger and fear and, and all of that can, can be a path to wisdom. I'm only dabbling like on the, the, the shallow end. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it is recognizing this can lead you down to basically it, what it can lead to is a lot of selfishness. And so what I think it needs to be framed in is, first of all, a very solid grounding of ethics, which is why I'm doing the precept study right now in, with my Zen teacher. So just really studying 
and examining not only not only the precepts but examining my own actions and thoughts from the the framework of those and really getting to know that better so that I can see when I start to get off of that path. But another one, uh, which I, I'm assuming you're really familiar with, given that you can frame the Buddhist teaching so well, is the uh, Bodhisattva path. Mm. So that's the path that I'm on right now. And uh, that doesn't mean that I'm, I've mastered or that I'm like this incredible uh, Bodhisattva, but it's this idea of putting all beings first and really trying to help all beings, even if that seems impossible. And so I've set a mission for myself. At first, it was to help a million people, and now it's 100 million, and someday it'll grow to 7 billion. But it's to, to help them through, through this training. And when you have that as your main guiding principle, then the, the fear and the anger that you might use on the path is in service of that. And you can always test that over and over. It's like, am I using this in service of them or am I trying to serve myself? And I think that's where a lot of the, the masters went wrong is that they, they didn't have anyone helping them to make sure they were staying on that path. Once you get to the top, like there's no one else. And um, when you're below that, you can have your teacher correct you. But when you're at the top, there's really no accountability there's no one to get to make sure you're you're sticking to that kind of guiding principle and so i'm i'm not going to allow myself to be at the top of any structure because mm -hmm. i don't believe in the uh that kind of hierarchy so i would like to be on that path with teachers and fellow practitioners who hold hold you to that standard so i think it's really important that you brought that up and it's an important it's an important discussion to have Nice, nice. Well, it's been great to get your your voice here, and uh, I'll just point out that anyone who wants more with you by way of instruction, I mean, you, you do a lot of work beyond just blogging. Yeah, you have a lot of courses that people can mm -hmm. take through your blog. Is there anything you want to highlight at the moment? What are you focused on now? Uh, well, this the the uncertainty and fear kind of training that I'm doing around helping people do their meaningful work. Is probably my most meaningful thing. That's the big mission that I was talking about. So there's my uh, fearless training program, and I'm also launching a new small group program where we're diving deep into that with people called Fearless Mastery. So fearlessness is kind of that Buddhist idea that I'm training in right now with other people, and it's a really rich and enlightening kind of training that I'm doing, and I really love it. So I would invite people to check that out. And is there any community around what you're doing? Is there, yes. is there a forum that people get access to? Or how, how are you working with that? Yeah, I don't think this is something you can do on your own. So I believe you have to be in community. So uh, both of those programs that I just mentioned, Fearless Training and then Fearless Mastery, they're both ones where you get on a team and you're, you're in this with teams. And so you report to them, you do your check-ins with them and review, but you also get the opportunity for them to help you call out your patterns, which is so important. Like if those gurus that you talked about had someone doing that for them, they might not have collapsed. So I, f I find it really important to not try and do this on your own and not be, and that, that takes us out of, also out of that kind of self-centered kind of training where we're just trying to improve ourselves and do this for selfish reasons. We're doing it in service of the team, but also in service of people that we care deeply about. So yeah, absolutely. They'll, both programs come with a uh, community and it's essential. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a point I, I think I don't make enough. I, I make it periodically at the end of, you know, various meditation sessions and in certain lessons on the app, but it almost can't be reiterated enough. It's very easy to feel like the time we take to practice, uh, you know, it's almost by definition solitary mm -hmm. and it can seem selfish, certainly from the outside and even from the inside, until you recognize that the reason why you're training your mind this way is not merely so that you can feel better, but so that you can be better company for others. I mean, when you just look at mm -hmm. how your stress and unhappiness gets exported to others moment by moment, I mean, especially those closest to you, I mean, just look at what your stress does to your intimate relationship, your, your marriage, your, your relationship to your kids. I mean, talk about a pandemic. Well, we have a pandemic mm. of unhappiness, and we've had it every moment of our lives. 
in this world. And what practice is, is a response to that ambient emergency, which really can stop in an instant. I mean, you really can just stop the machinery of your unhappiness completely. And again, in the beginning, it's going to seem like you're only getting off the ride for a few seconds, and then the, the whole juggernaut starts up again. But having a hundred moments like that a day mm. is an enormous difference. And that's attainable in a, in a very short span of time for most people. And then it, and then it becomes on some level a choice, right? You can just decide, all right, how long do I want to stay angry for? And, you know, how long do I want to be the person who's broadcasting his unhappiness at a family dinner to everyone else? And for me, you know, for the longest time, and, you know, for most of us, for more or less ever, it's not going to be a matter of no longer experiencing these classically negative states of mind, you know, fear and anger and anxiety. And, right. But it, it's the time it takes to recover that mm. changes so utterly. I mean, the difference between being anxious for an entire day and being anxious for 12 seconds is enormous. And in 12 seconds, you can get the same actionable information. You can understand, yeah. okay, well, this here's a problem that's worth paying attention to. And now the mind is back in balance. Whereas in the alternate world, where you don't actually have this capacity, you're just, you're going to be anxious for as long as the bad luck of circumstance is going to dictate, and then you'll be knocked around by the next emotion. But really, our, our minds are the only thing we have to offer other people. Mm. You know, we, we just have to retire the force of this allegation that there's something selfish about using attention in this way and taking time to train. That's, that's such an important point. And I, I just want to testify to that. In my own life, I've become a much better father because of that, a much better husband. And just my ability to relate to people in my work and in my family and my loved ones, I've become so much calmer, so much more compassionate, less angry and short-tempered and irritable and annoyed. So yeah, I mean, it this it helps us personally so that's i think it's it's a good thing but it ripples outward and you know if you are kind to someone instead of annoyed at them or frustrated with them it'll change their day and then that ripples out to the people that they interact with so i found it it's such a powerful thing to just keep practicing this and start to shift like you said how quickly we can shift back to calmness and acceptance yeah, and it also opens the door to repairing rifts mm -hmm. in relationships that otherwise you, you lose that opportunity because like if if you can't recover quickly, like if yeah. if you find yourself getting annoyed in a conversation and you know your tone is sounding angry or you just mm -hmm. said something that in retrospect you probably shouldn't have said, it's like you can become more agile in repairing those problems you can put out those small fires while they're still small because you can honestly triangulate on yourself and say okay well i was a jerk for about four seconds <laughs> there and it's not who i want to be that's not who i feel like now and you know I, I disavow that whole thing that just happened right yeah you can pivot and reshape the relationship in real time Whereas if you're somebody who just flew off the handle and was an asshole for an entire day or an entire year, you know, that's yeah. your life, right? That's what people think of you. And it's very hard to, I think it was Nietzsche who said that when we force someone to change their opinion of us, they hold the effort it costs them very much against us, mm. right? To try to rewrite history when there's that much history yeah. just becomes a doomed exercise. But this just, it, it does create a kind of fluidity in one's way of being with other people where it's just you can actually apologize and mean it and rather than it feel like a loss of face hmm. it's like the emotional algebra gets reversed most people are deeply resistant to admitting they were wrong whereas right. this whole thing can flip i mean the moment you recognize how 
reliably wrong you can be in, you know, in terms of your tone, in terms of an opinion you were attached to, whatever it is, you recognize that you, you want to be very quick to see when you're wrong. You don't want to double down and triple down and quadruple down on being wrong. And, and even if vanity was your, your only metric, I mean, you just, <laughs> when other people can see that you're wrong and you're doubling down, you look like the stupid person. Yeah. So it's just, you want the flexibility to be able to laugh at yourself or to be able to just get off where you were standing a few moments ago because it is in fact the wrong place and you and others can see it. But it, it's really hard to realize until you feel the satisfaction of, I mean, honestly, that a real apology, right, where you, you recognize deeply how wrong you were and you just apologize in a way that just has no, you're not holding anything back. It's just, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that I was such an asshole. That's one of the most satisfying things in the world to do. Mm. Uh, you know, it's just, it is such a relief to be able to do that. And yeah, I mean, some of the great moments in my life have been apologies, mm. you know, and less and less am I, am I in a situation where I feel like I have to apologize. But when I look back at I'm probably counting some of these on one hand or even three fingers, but the moment where you really recognize you were not who you wanted to be and mm -hmm. you just disavow it, there's something utterly cleansing about that. And, you know, we can have that in, in microcosm all the time. People feel like there's is one humiliation after another seeing your mind too clearly, but at, <laughs> all of that flips. And you can just recognize that there's just this continual renewal that's possible in the present. I love that. Well, Leo, it's been great to talk to you. And uh, yeah. I obviously recommend that everyone go to Zen Habits and get more of your mind. 